further ado, I will uh, introduce our guest speaker, Jeff. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, Jeff Carrier uh, is joining us to talk about In the Bedroom of the Shark. I mean, what a cool name is that? Underwater Dating and Mating in the Florida Keys. Dr. Jeffrey Carrier is a professor emeritus at, uh, of biology at Albion College, where he was a faculty member. Uh, Albion College is in Michigan. Right. I'm in college where he was a faculty member from 1979 to 2010. He earned his PhD in biology from the University of Miami. His primary research interests center on various aspects of the physiology and ecology of nurse sharks in the Florida Keys. His most recent work has investigated the reproductive biology and mating behaviors of this species in a long-term study from an isolated region of the Florida Keys. The studies now focus in the Indian River Lagoon. Jeff holds an appointment as an adjunct research scientist with Moat Marine Laboratories Center for Shark Research. In addition to his many publications, and you can see some of them are up here on the table. Um, I'm sorry, in addition to his many research publications in the scientific literature, he's written these incredible books. So he's written and edited six books on sharks and their biology, and the pictures are fantastic, uh, and numerous articles in the popular press. And I overheard him say that he's uh, also that some of his work has been put on Shark Week and National Geographic, and he's been in National Ge Geographic Magazine and a recent article on Rookery Islands published in the Florida Sportsman Magazine in March. So he's, got, he's a very prolific author. He's written a great deal. He's got a lot of information to share with us. And I welcome uh, Dr. Jeff Carrier. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Like, normally I would hug you, but it's so close to me. Well, it's exciting to be up here, but perhaps more exciting is to actually see real people. Uh, it's been so long since we've seen anything other than a Zoom presentation, so uh, it's nice to actually see some some people uh, in attendance. In addition to those of you uh, on Zoom, welcome. Uh, what we'd like to do today is talk to you a little bit about uh, my favorite subject, and, and that is uh, sharks, particularly sharks of the Florida Keys. And more recently, some of the work that we've been trying to get underway here in the Indian River Lagoon. Um, you may be asking yourself, why in the world would we possibly want to talk about sharks, especially sharks in the Florida Keys? And I'd like to try to give you some background on that and uh, uh, extend to you some understanding of why the Indian River Lagoon is important to continue this work. Now, um, I think it's Im important for you to understand that what we're going to be looking at today is uh, pretty highly graphic. Um, those of you at home who might have young people in attendance with you watching this, uh, be forewarned, this is, this is graphic. Uh, there is shark nudity and, and there will be uh, mating behaviors uh, that will be shown during the course of, of uh, our discussion. So we'd like to talk about what we think is some very unique activity. Uh, this is the only systematic study of shark mating and mating behavior that's ever been done. Um, nowhere else in the world do we have access to a population of sharks like we do in the Florida Keys. And I'll try to defend uh, why that's important a little bit later. So again, uh, the fundamental questions is why in the world should we be talking about this at an MRC lunch and learn seminar? Um, what application does it have locally? And what value does it have to us here? Now, what should we discuss in the course of, of such a presentation? I guess the fundamental question is, are sharks in trouble? Um, um, I think we probably uh, amongst us have seen many Discovery Channel shows and probably quite a few uh, National Geographic shows. So um, the big question will be, uh, are they really in trouble? And I'll, I'll try to offer some evidence to support that. Um, and if they are in trouble, what, what are the sources of the problems? What could possibly give rise to, to issues that face um, one of the top level predators in the ocean? How in the world could they be in trouble? Well, there are generally three categories that people like to cite as reasons for, for why we ha may have some concern over populations. One of these is overfishing. Is that a possibility? Um, the evidence suggests that more than 100 million sharks are taken each year. That ought to be cause for concern in and of itself. Uh, coastal urban development, um, a degradation of the habitat, 
Wow, what better place to study that than the Indian River Lagoon, um, where we see rampant development and we have reason to believe that there have been some environmental catastrophes with hopes that that might change. And uh, the age old question um, about climate change, uh, uh, is, is that affecting uh, shark populations? And if, if so, how? Um, if overfishing is an issue, and this is what a lot of people center on, then what are the solutions? What possible ways could you could you have to restrict this and, and perhaps uh, lower the pressure? Uh, do you ban shark fishing altogether? Oh, I, I don't think you can do that uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, restrict fishing for some species that are thought to be at risk. Well, we already do that. We do that in Florida, particularly lemon sharks, hammerhead sharks. All hammerheads are protected. Lemon sharks are protected. So we know that we can do some of that and that it has been done. Um, limit the number of sharks that you can take, uh, both commercially and recreationally. Uh, the recreational fisheries in Florida is, is uh, one of the better regulated fisheries and recreational fishermen are limited to what species they can catch, how many and what size. So there are some things that are being done. Um, if you're gonna regulate these things, how in the world can you do this? And what information do you need to have to be able to regulate a fishery? And how do you do this in such a way that you protect the populations, that you keep the populations sustainable, and that you don't put people out of business who do this for a living? They have a right to make a living, a good living, and the commercial fishers who I know simply want regulations that are well-founded in solid biology, not by guess and by God. And that's, that's typical, that's, that's very hard to do. So the questions that the biologists wanna ask and that the fishers want answered uh, include some of the following. How fast do sharks grow? More importantly, how old do they have to be before they reach sexual maturity? And this is tied into the first one. You gotta know how fast they grow. Um, and you gotta know how old they have to be and how big they have to be before they can reproduce. Um, and then how many offspring do they produce? The, the critical thing here is that these three parameters are so very important to determine what number of animals you can take from a population and allow it to replenish its numbers. This is sustainability. So how can you get these kinds of, of data? What do you need to know about shark? Well, my hero, Matt Hooper, uh, the biologist from JAWS, best sums it up and sums up shark biology for us, and I quote, what we're dealing with here is a perfect engine, an eating machine. It's really a miracle of evolution. All this machine does is swim and eat and make little sharks, and that's all. Well, for me, as a reproductive biologist, make little sharks is what gets my attention. So. Uh, uh, I guess then we need to ask the question, how, how do sharks make little sharks? It's fundamental that we understand reproduction. And that's what drove us into this, driven by these questions that the commercial and recreational industry needed answers to. So that switched us over to, uh, um, to studying shark reproduction. Now, the vast percentage of information that we know about shark reproduction and reproductive behavior comes from the study of nurse sharks. One of the reasons for this is that these animals are found in huge numbers in shallow water, which makes them accessible. Now, I'd love to study mating and reproduction in Makos and Great Whites and things like that, but these are open water pelagic species, and how in the world are you gonna find out where they mate and then are you really going to want to get in the water with these guys when you know they have other things on their mind? Eh, maybe I, I don't know. I, I, the question for me is mood. I'm not interested. I, I'm interested in nurse sharks. Okay. Well, the study that uh, that we've been conducting since the early 1990s is centered in the Dry Tortugas National Park. This is about 78 miles west of Key West. It's a ways out. The only way you can get there is by, nowadays, by ferry or by seaplane. Or if you own a boat that can take 78 miles of open water, you can get there on your own boat. There is no water at the fort. There are portalettes. That's it. There is some camping out there, but you have to take all your own supplies, all your own water, food, 
and I would recommend extra toilet paper for the portalettes. Now, this area is well known for the shallow waters that surround the Tortugas and for the high population of nurse sharks. Now, this is the first picture of nurse sharks that I want you to draw your attention to the depth of the water. You can see the surface here, and this particular picture is taken in five feet of water. So this is gonna become important for uh, further studies. Now, nurse sharks are in shallow water, particularly farther south, uh, down from Miami on south. And trust me on this, they're pretty easy to find. They're not necessarily solitary animals. You'll often find these animals in large concentrations. Um, sometimes in places where you wish maybe they weren't in large concentrations. You're trying to work your way out to your boat in the morning and you step onto your dock and this is what you see, it can cause you to have more than one cups of coffee to make sure you're not taking a look at things you shouldn't be seeing. Um, they're very common in shallow waters. They particularly like mangrove habitats in the shallow bay areas. We see this particularly from all from south of, of the peninsula, from, from the west coast all the way down through the Keys, all the way to Tortugas. They're just, they're just plenty of them. Um, because of access to these animals and because they're in such shallow water, it makes it relatively easy for us to study these. And because we have a study that's spanned over 25 years, what we've been able to learn, we think serves as a template for the study of other shark species. Now I'll say at the outset, um, in deference to my commercial friends, this is not a commercially valuable species. The fins have virtually no value. They're collectively called chips, which a commercial uh, fisher would, would just avoid. So the shark fin industry, which was responsible for a great deal of diminishing populations, um, would stay away from these. So that said, what we're studying here is not the same as studying perhaps the sandbar shark or the dusky, much more commercially valuable species. But nevertheless, we got to start somewhere. And since these are in shallow water and we can find them, it's a good place to start. Now, fertilization in sharks is internal, the same as it is in many other species, particularly the mammals. And the structures that are shown here on the pelvic fins are what are called claspers. They're on the males. This is an organ through which sperm is passed from the male to the female. Now this is tricky at best. Um, here is a schematic diagram of, of what this, this looks like. In this particular instance, a male grasps the female by the pectoral fin. This is the frontmost fin and holds, they don't have, they can't hug, they don't have any arms or anything. You gotta hang on some way. Uh, and so a grip is established by grabbing the pectoral fin and once the grip is established, then a clasper will be inserted into the female, copulation will occur, sperm will be passed to the female, and presumably, sometime down the road, fertilization of the eggs will occur. Now, as, as I said, this is relatively tricky. And for a male to insert a clasper is a task. Trust me on this. And what we have found over the years is that there needs to be some level of, I hesitate to use the word cooperation, that sounds too much like a human trait, but if the female is not willing to accept mating, it will not occur. This is strictly female choice, okay? Now, this is what it looks like in real life. This is in three feet of water and the animal to the top of, of this particular picture is a male. And if you look closely, you can see that the male has grasped the fin. And this is an actual copulation event. The clasper has been inserted and mating is occurring. Now, this is a study that has, has been seen a little bit in captive facilities with other species, particularly smaller species, uh, not too often in the wild and certainly not in a systematic study. Now, we'll look at it uh, from a, a different point of view. Here is the male uh, grasping the female. Now, uh, for those of you who are photographers, uh, let me give you a little hint here, particularly those of you who are watching on Zoom. These pictures that you're about to see are taken with ultra-wide angle lenses. 
What that means is uh, using an ultra wide means you can get really close to animals diminishing the amount of water over which you take a picture, which in dirty water makes it appear a lot clearer. The downside to this is, did I mention that you got to get pretty close? So these pictures that you're about to see, this particular picture was taken at a distance of 18 inches. No. Yes, 18 inches. And the animal on the left is the male, a male who came to be known as red eye in our study. He was later captured and measured at 10 feet in length. So this is not a small animal. Now, this grip, you might think, would be problematic for a female, and sharks do have teeth. And here is a, a, a close-up of a female's pectoral fin that has been chewed on a little bit. Now, nurse sharks, it's commonly thought that maybe if you get attacked by a nurse shark, you might get gummed to death. Um, they do have teeth, trust me. I have ample scars uh, to go along with the stupidity that put me in a position to get bitten, and they do have good teeth. Nothing like a mako or a tiger or a lemon or something like that, in which these shreds can, uh, these fins can be shredded. So very, very uh, problematic. Female skin, however, is really pretty neat. There is what's called a sexual dimorphism. That is a difference between males and females. A male skin might be less than an eighth of an inch deeper. So a female skin might be more than a quarter of an inch thick. So there is some protection that's evolved over, over the years. Now, here again is, is uh, uh, a picture of, of mating uh, up close again. Um, the, the way we set our study up is my research partner, Wes Pratt, formerly of the National Marine Fisheries Service, was a reproductive biologist who was interested in kind of the business end of reproduction. He was interested in the claspers and the mechanics of clasper work, and we didn't know anything about the grip. So our procedure was to station him near the reproductive structures, the claspers and the females uh, cloaca and put me in front of the animals, okay? I didn't realize the stupidity of this until we finished filming some of the mating events. And when the mating event is over, um, they tolerate our presence, but when mating is over, they wanna get away. And whoever's in front of the animal gets run over, okay? So I learned the hard way that maybe I shouldn't have listened to Wes after all. Now, one of the features of our study is that our animals are tagged. In the dorsal fin, you can see what's called a roto tag. Um, any of you from the farmlands might recognize this as a cattle ear tag. And so we're able to tag these animals and we're able to see these tags from a distance. Uh, we also use transmitters. These are ultrasonic transmitters, um, which can give us some information on the animal's movement. Uh, those of you who might have thought that nurse sharks were couch potatoes and didn't move much, that they were always residential, I'm sorry to break your hearts. Our animals from Tortugas have been found in Sarasota, have been found in Tampa Bay, and perhaps more exciting is that our animals uh, that were tagged in Bimini in the Bahamas were found in Jupiter, they cross the Gulf Stream. Can you imagine how terrifying that must be to a nurse shark to cross all that deep water? But even more important, they were found back in Bimini. So this is movement and some site fidelity that is some uh, attachment to the site. Our animals from Tortugas have gone to Sarasota and Tampa and come back to Tortugas. So there's some exciting news in there for, for those of us who are nurse shark biologists and counter those of you that think these are couch potatoes with no charisma. Uh, you're just wrong. Uh, well, uh, we have also managed to do some other studies and we've worked very closely with the National Geographic Society and Dr. Mike Heithouse, who we talked about earlier, who is at uh, uh, Florida International University, who's done several uh, shows, including a series called Critter Cam Chronicles, in which we actually put these cameras on sharks, and in this case, a nurse shark. These cameras are attached to the animal. They have a special circuitry that will break the attachment the camera will float to the surface and you can see an antenna coming out the orange end here. That's a VHF radio antenna, so we can find them when they come to the surface. And we found some pretty exciting things from, uh, from using these critter cams. Now, um, we're gonna now take a look at some video that I hope will give you some insight into what this uh, 
mating activity actually looks like. Now this is a pair, and you're gonna see one of the values of tagging as you look at um, this mating activity once we get a little bit closer. Notice the depth of the water, okay? This is why we've been so successful with our work, is because we can get access to these animals in very shallow water. Now here is the male with the grip and insertion of the clasper. And please note the tag that you'll see in a couple of places. This is vitally important for this work. Um, the obvious is it allows us to determine who's dating whom, but it also helps us a little bit later when we're trying to tease out the uh, specifics of uh, the genetics of this particular population. So you can see the grip. Look at the size of that fin of the female, and look at the, the male has got it gripped all the way down to its base. We have actually seen mating events stop because the, the male can no longer respire. So it, it, his mouth is totally full of fin. Now, in this particular instance, she is not resisting at all. She has made the choice in this particular case. She has a variety of, of moves that would rival any judo moves that you've ever seen. And if she's not interested in a male that attempts to establish a grip, she will throw him off. I've had males thrown on top of me while we've been trying to film this as she has, has uh, turned them loose. I'm in front, you can see my head and my snorkel. This is my partner, Wes Pratt. And no, this is not a hug and, and this is not gonna be um, post-copulation snuggling, I'm sorry. It's just, you can attach whatever human traits you want, but, but snuggling is not one of them. Okay. Um, now, there, again, to remind you, uh, this is this is what the fin looks like after an event such as you you've just witnessed here. Now, the mating scars are important because they help us to identify the females who are sexually reproductively active at that particular time. What our studies have shown us in the past is that female nurse sharks are reproductively active for two to three weeks every two years, okay? So um, the reproductive cycling is such that I better get it right because the window is very small. Um, obviously it works because there are a lot of nurse sharks. So we know that reproduction has been pretty successful. Now, we like this particular study because these animals are, as I've said many times, in very shallow water. They're easy for us to get to, and the shallow water is also a way for females to avoid suitors who they don't wish to mate with. Now, let me tell you straight out that this selectivity probably works for the first week or 10 days. Thereafter, she's maybe not so selective. Okay, and maybe a little promiscuous, uh, as some data that I'll show you suggest. One of the things we find is that sometimes mating is not a single male event. In this particular slide, um, I, I'm showing you five males, there are actually two others that are involved here. So the question becomes, well, what about group behavior? And what about cooperative behavior? Does it exist? What about learning? Does it exist? We have seen that often what we would designate as a dominant or alpha male is the one that is given the priority for mating and other males will not intervene. As a matter of fact, one of the behaviors that we're studying and, and trying to write up is something that we call blocking behavior where another male will get in front of the mating pair and prevent the female from moving away. 
Now, I, I don't want to name drop, but those of you who have studied behavior at all may have heard of E.O. Wilson. E.O. Wilson has studied behavior and, and cooperative behaviors and, and whatnot. I had the opportunity in a previous life to host uh, Dr. Wilson, uh, who actually wound up doing some work in his, in his youthful career in the Tortugas. He studies ants, but he also studies behavior. I showed him these behaviors that we had recorded. He wrote a book called Consilience, in which he talked about um, uh, the willingness of some members of a particular species to assist other members to successfully mate altruism, if you will. And he said in the book that the one group that didn't demonstrate any kind of, of uh, behavior such as this uh, were elasmobranch, sharks, skates, and rays. I showed him the video. He suggested, perhaps I need to do a rewrite on this particular chapter. So he saw it over and over and over again and said, this, this looks like cooperative behavior. This like, looks like altruistic behavior to me. So if, if E.O. Wilson can say it, then Jeff Carrier can say it and believe it. So I'm, I'm going along with that. So the question then is, OK, you've, you've studied mating behavior. You've seen it. Um, and then they swim away. So what in the world happens next? Um, if, if you're not there, you know, it, the study is over. Um, well, you know, the, the animal's got to be born somewhere along the line. And, you, you know, you want to want to be happy that you've created a good eating machine out of the deal. If you're parental sharks, there is no parental care. So uh, once uh, birthing occurs, that's it. Well, one of the things we've discovered is that the eggs in nurse sharks are huge. They're the size of tennis balls. Actually, anybody who's interested here, I have some nurse shark egg cases with me uh, that I'll show you a little bit later. And for size comparison, this is uh, that's my partner, Wes Pratt, holding a, an unfertilized nurse shark egg. What this means is that since these things are so big that we ought to be able to visualize them internally. So we thought, what better way to do this than to try to use an ultrasound? What we wanted to do was capture some of these animals that we had filmed mating and keep them in captivity till they gave birth. We don't have a clue what their gestation period was, no clue whatsoever, and a lot of other questions. So what we did was enlist some veterinarians and some colleagues of mine at SeaWorld of Orlando. We convinced them to come down into Tortugas. And one of the vets, Dr. Mike Walsh, who is now at the University of Florida. Oh, it hurts to say that. Uh, Seminoles, I'm sorry. In any case, in any case, um, we were able to do some ultrasounds in the field. And this is what the ultrasound looks like. Now, I've labeled egg cases here. Um, the next one I'll leave up to your imagination. Those of you who are parents and have seen ultrasounds of your kids, you probably have no trouble with this. To me, ultrasound is the ultimate voodoo. It is simply black magic. I would have no clue what I'm looking at if it wasn't for Mike, who pointed out the tip of the snout, the eye socket, and the measurement cursor, and the dorsal fin. This is an ultrasound of a pregnant nurse shark. Okay, so we have some sense of, of a way to tell if there are eggs present, moreover, if those eggs have hatched. Now, when they develop in nurse sharks, nurse shark eggs are encapsulated. This is an example of one um, that what it looks like out of the egg case. And you can see the embryonic shark at the top of the egg. And you can see what's called the yolk sac, which is what the embryo feeds on uh, during the time of its gestation. Now, I'm a really visual guy. Ultrasounds don't get it for me. I don't understand them very well. I'll use them. They're a great tool, but I, I, I need to see. So we managed to persuade the vets to try using endoscopy. Now, we, many of us know what endoscopy is. Unfortunately, it's not a tool that we're particularly drawn to. And endoscopy is uh, the vector for colonoscopy. But it does have its use in, in the living world in other ways. Here, for example, is an endoscope taken in the uterus of a nurse shark. This is approximately four months after we filmed this animal mating. And this is a juvenile nurse shark. The egg case, it has hatched. 
This is the animal inside the uterus, and the red tissue in the upper right of this photograph is the uterine tissue. So this is hatched internally, and we think that sometime two to three weeks after hatching is when they give birth. Okay, so this is much more visual for me. I understand this, I can see this, so it makes much more sense. Um, I, I guess then we should summarize what we've learned out of this study and what we've learned from nurse sharks. Going back to the initial questions that we asked, these animals grow slowly. Nurse sharks grow four to six inches per year. Now do the math on this. These guys are born at a foot long and they grow to 11 to 12 feet. So if you do the math on that, four to six inches per year, these animals can be very old before they reach their full length. And what this tells us at this growth rate, and when we know they become sexually mature, it's 18 to 22 years before they become sexually mature. A female nurse shark's gotta be seven and a half feet long, a male about seven feet long before they're sexually mature. This takes a long time. Now, if this was a commercially valuable species, tell me what's gonna happen if it becomes the target of a commercial fishery. Do you have to have a degree to figure this out? The fishery is gonna collapse, okay? Well, because of our captive studies, we were able to determine that nurse sharks are pregnant for four and a half to five months. This is keeping them in non-display tanks in Orlando, keeping females all by themselves, putting a false bottom in, because after we did this a couple times, we didn't see any pups. And we thought maybe mom was cannibalizing her offspring. So um, we were able to get some, uh, uh, some offspring. And as I mentioned earlier, they reproduce on a two year cycle at least two, perhaps even longer for some species, okay? And the litters may be as high as 40 pups. That's, that's pretty good. Um, some species like whale sharks may give birth to over 200 pups in a litter. That's exciting. Other species, one. Makos, sand tigers, maybe just one at a time. So unfortunately, some of those makos are oh, delicious fish, and if they become the target of a fishery, um, that fishery is not going to last. There are worldwide efforts to try to get the Makos listed as a protected species by CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. Uh, there are a couple of countries that are resisting that and stopping the whole process. The United States is one of them. Um, I told you about some promiscuity going on here. Well, here's evidence that she may not be as selective as we'd like to believe because the litters that we recovered, we had mom right there, so we had her DNA. We had the DNA from all the pups. And when we started looking at it a little more closely, lo and behold, our litter of, of in this particular case, 30 pups had six fathers. Now, think about it. What I said a few minutes ago about there possibly being a dominant male, okay, if that male were dominant for all the females down there and sired all the litters, what could you say about genetic diversity? There would be none. So the advantage, as we as humans see it, in this particular case, is that we have a, a wealth of genetic diversity thanks to, to this strategy. Now, there are some questions that we have to ask. Um, are the behaviors that we've seen and the physiological attributes, the, the gestation period and and uh, and when she comes into to reproductive readiness. Is this unique to nurse sharks, no matter where they are, or is it unique to the keys? Okay. Um, are the keys populations, now we're talking dry tortugas in this case, or the Indian River Lagoon populations, there are nurse sharks here, yes there are, thank goodness. Are they separate? Or is there any genetic overlap? This is one of the things that we're trying to look at now. Are inshore shallow areas restricted to South Florida, the Keys, where the waters are so very shallow? Or what about up here? I've never heard reports of nurse shark mating in the lagoon. Do they mate in deep water? Well, we know they do. I mean, it's been photographed at 130 feet many years ago. So it's possible. And how do these populations compare? This is one of the things that that I'm trying to look at. And then where are the nursery areas? You know, all the years, I've, we've been working in Tortugas over 25 years, one neonate in that whole time, that's a, that's a brand new pup. Now, 
where do they go? We may not see them because they may run under reefs. And neonate nurse sharks are teeny tiny animals, or they may be eaten. I have seen nurse sharks eaten by Goliath groupers. Okay. I like nurse sharks. I will leave it there. Um, what's the role of habitat? How critical is habitat? And habitat, by the way, that's necessary for mating or pupping or feeding is called critical habitat, and it's protected by statute. So what do we do about these, these areas? And then do other species follow similar modes of reproduction? Um, I don't know. What can, we, what can we do for other species? If other species are similar and they grow very slowly, and if they take many years to mature, or shark 18 to 22, okay, and if females reproduce every two years or longer, um, and if they only have a few pups, um, how does this influence commercial and recreational fisheries? If other species, more valuable, have similar characteristics, we could be in a world of trouble. In 1983, the National Marine Fisheries Service said to fishers, wow, you know, we got ground fish in trouble here, a codfish and, and some other species, lobsters and things like that. You ought to diversify the fishery. You know what? There is an untapped fishery out here, and that's for sharks. If you tell a fisher that there is an untapped resource, and that they can make a living from it, they're gonna develop a fishery that can do that. In three years, the shark fishery collapsed. Three years, the fishery collapsed. And then NOAA, National Marine Fishery Service, had to scramble to develop regulations to protect an industry that killed itself so very quickly. And their reaction was sometimes typical of how regulation uh, authorities respond, they overregulate it. They just stopped things. They put the fishers out of business. They did not have the information. They did not have the data. We did not have studies about reproduction. We did not know how populations could be regulated in such a way that they could replenish themselves and see to sustainability. So we've been struggling ever since to put together regulations. Now, commercial fishers, if you know any, uh, you should talk to them about the shark problem that we have offshore right now. We have a problem where the sandbar shark, once overfished and thought to be locally extinct in many areas, sandbar sharks are causing so many problems from commer for commercial fishers right now, they can't get a snapper or a grouper from deep water to the surface they get the heads to the surface. This is a problem called depredation. And now the National Marine Fishery Service wants to study that. And they want to try to pair biologists with fishers. Try that sometime. <laughs> you know, the last thing a fisherman wants is to be paired with a biologist because we pose the threat of regulation. Even if we're actually, some of us are overeducated fishers to begin with just went into biology because we wound up going to school too long and missed the boat on fishing. So I understand what they're saying. A couple of our very best friends in Sebastian, in fact, are commercial fishers, and I, I, I feel their pain. Well, if, if this is true, then, then what in the world are we going to do to protect the fishery, uh, to protect the, the fisher, to protect the species? Um, and I, I guess the questions I want to ask right now are, what about other species? How do we extend this to other species? And what's the role of the Indian River Lagoon in all this? Well, the history of the Indian River Lagoon and elasmobranch studies is vast. Elasmobranchs, by the way, are sharks, skates, and rays. If you hear me use that term, that's what I'm referring to. These are papers that have been published for a long time on distribution and, and biology of, of elasmal brain fishes and so on and so on and so on. So the IRL is well known through the years um, as, a, as a wonderful area for elasmal brain species. Some of you have seen the rays in shallow water around some of our spoil islands. Lots of other species here. Manta rays have been found in here. and. And uh, yellow rays, uh, the southern stingray is very common in this area. And yes, we even have some of the more important species globally endangered 
um, small tooth sawfish, I draw your attention to August 4th at the Kennedy Space Center. A sawfish was found there on May 5th of 2020. Three were photographed in Melbourne. Okay, ring a bell? Okay, yes, they are still here. The lagoon is vitally important. Lots of other species in this area. Uh, we've got lemon sharks in this area, a species I hate more than any other species on the planet. Uh, these animals are designed for one thing, to bite and maim and kill biologists. Um, I, I, I do not like the black tips. Those of you who follow the migrations along shore every year, and Steve Kajira's work out of uh, Florida, uh, Atlantic University know of these migrations. Um, one of the more common IRL species is the black nose shark. We've been chasing transmitters from these guys for colleagues for some time. Um, probably the best known species in the Indian River Lagoon is unfortunately a bull shark. Um, I say unfortunately because these are very nasty animals. Um, one of the reasons why they're important to study for the lagoon is the fact that this is one of the few species that is known to penetrate fresh water. And I'm not talking about making a, a, a momentary appearance. In the early 1900s, a fisherman off uh, Illinois actually went to Illinois Fish and Game with an animal that he caught and said, this isn't the sturgeon, you know, this isn't a catfish, what is this? This is a thousand miles up the Mississippi River, and it was identified by an Illinois fish and game biologist as a bull shark. These are the animals that are found in Lake Nicaragua. These are the animals that are found in the Zambezi River. And these are the animals that are found in the Indian River Lagoon. So we know that we know that they're around. The questions we have is that we we know this is a nursery ground. We can find juvenile uh, bull sharks, and they've been studied forever in this particular area. We're less uh, informed about whether or not this is a mating area for bull sharks, and this is where we come into the study. Um, here are some papers, just to give you an example of some of the work that's been done on bull sharks since, since early on. These are just some that I could pull up just instantly from my collection. There are papers that date back into the 50s and 60s that describe the bull shark and the bull shark activity up here. Now, we don't have Sebastian residents or Melbourne residents or Vero residents that disappear from time to time, so they're not really a, a threat from that standpoint. The vast percentage of interactions with bull sharks occur in the surf. Okay, We know that there's evidence that these animals actually may come into surf uh, to give birth. Well, consider the surf. It's noisy. The visibility is terrible. There's no acoustic corridor with the waves breaking and everything. They can't home in on a sound. They can't home in on a smell because of the disturbance. And they can't see. If they run into something, they lash out and they bite. And this is a vast percentage of attacks that occur. And, and we revised the terminology recently, and we don't like to refer to attacks, but, but more interactions. Um, an attack, you'd know if you were being attacked. I mean, come animals steamrolling on you. We don't get very many reports of those from people who've been attacked, however. And every single one of these, in fact, are papers that are, that are on, uh, on bull sharks. So just to give you some sense of, of where we're trying to go with this to conclude, the studies that we're trying to establish in the Indian River Lagoon will look at some of the following questions. Um, have the recent environmental catastrophes that we know the IRL has faced, have they affected populations of, of bull sharks as well as other elasmobranchs in recent years? Uh, we know of the problems we've had, the disappearance of seagrasses, um, the runoff from LACO. I know many of us are holding out hope that the Army Corps of Engineers' recent plan to redirect flow actually materializes. I'm not in favor of a decade-long program to put this in place, but it's, it's better than what we have now. We need data now to show whether or not the populations have changed, and then someone needs to do this very same study many years down the road to see if there, in fact, has been recovery. Uh, and what's the influence of fresh water on these nurseries? We don't really know. Well, are they coming in because of the St. Sebastian River and Port St. Lucie, the St. Lucie River and whatnot? Is that drawing bull sharks in? What, what makes it so attractive to them? 
Um, is, is it a mating ground? That's what I'm interested in. Although it's a lot easier to get in shallow water and clear water with nurse sharks. I'm not so sure if I saw a mating pair of bull sharks that I particularly like to jump in the water with. But, but uh, that's what I have my wonderful wife, Carol, for. Uh, she knows how to use a camera. And so uh, she hasn't been informed of her role yet, but, uh, and she's not walking out the back door. So I guess she has been. And then how has habitat changed uh, affected other elasmobranch species? We know the disappearance of seagrasses is catastrophic. When we are heralding the appearance of six additional acres of seagrass, in the Sebastian area, six, ac six acres is nothing. And yet we're excited about this. I mean, it's better than losing six more acres, but that's not enough. There's a lot of work that has to be done and the cleanup and everything, the freshwater runoff and other things are just a part of the problem. What we're after here is just anything we can possibly do so that we can get these juvenile animals to survive to see that the preservation of these various species is maintained. The role of apex predators in any ecosystem is well established. We've got to do whatever we can to maintain these levels so that we don't get catastrophic damage to marine food chains. Um, that is our goal. And we fortunately are not alone in this. We have a lot of other folks who are interested. Um, this is Jill Morris who contributed many photographs uh, to this. She was a research assistant uh, with Carol and I many, many years ago uh, when we were studying in Tortugas. She was actually a cook's assistant and she snuck out on several occasions, one of which almost cost her her job, to see what we were doing. Um, when our trips were over, she immediately went back, finished her degree in marine biology and started an organization called Sharks for Kids. Um, this is a not-for-profit and she runs it along with a former student of mine from Albion College, and uh, they give presentations worldwide to audiences by Zoom and sometimes in person. Uh, and she will work with us. She contributed a lot of photographs, and she's been a, a good partner in this for a long time. So I, I close by giving you a nurse shark kiss and uh, reminders that uh, these animals deserve our protection in the same way any other creature does. And... Uh, uh, I, hope, I hope you understand a little bit better what we've done and, and uh, the impact that we think it's had and yet uh, the incredible amount of work that lies ahead. So thank you very much. I think if we have a little bit of time, there may be a question or two. Yes. And if you would write your question, because we have to read it into the microphone up front, I'll come by and get it. Sorry, I meant to remind you earlier. That's what these cards are for. You can write your questions. Um, I'm here that we have to read it into the microphone so that then people can hear it too. That's why we're doing it that way. Does anybody have one ready that I can grab? Or do you have some from the. Yes, I got two right here. Great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We needed to have a pre-screener here so that the difficult questions are rejected. <laughs> like the ones with tiny friends? <laughs> you can read them. All right. Renee, can you hear me okay on the thing? You can hear my mic? All right. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. I immensely enjoyed it. Well, thank you. Nicole. Uh, okay. All right. So our first question is, um, is there a particular area where nurse sharks are found in the Indian River Lagoon? Well, most of the uh, areas that, that we've been told about, now we haven't been able to systematically sample enough to be able to give you an idea of, of where you can find them. Our best resource has been the commercial fishers who work here off Sebastian. I had one fisher, you may find this difficult to believe, but one fisher who we worked with and spoke with quite a bit actually came to my boat and downloaded 1,100 waypoints that he thought were useful for where he had seen nurse sharks. This is a, a commercial fisher who also is a spear fisherman and mentioned to us the sites that he thought were critical where he had seen not only solitary nurse sharks, but where he had seen aggregations. Now these range from some 
bottom topography, some bottom relief that is a, as close as a half mile offshore to some which is 10 to 15 miles offshore. We're handicapped a little bit in our sampling methods. Um, there are times of the year when I'm not allowed to set one type of sampling uh, uh, gear inshore because of the manatees. And then at that same time of the year, I can't set some of my gear offshore because of the right whales. So we've been able to modify our gear to meet the requirements uh, of these particular studies. And so we'll increase our, our sampling here and be able to better answer your question when we come back for a return visit. Wonderful. Um, and then kind of building upon that, um, have you studied if the nurse sharks are being affected by pollution in the Indian River Lagoon, or is that part of your current study, I believe? It's not part of my study. I know there are other people who are interested. Dr. Jim Gelschleider at the University of North Florida out of Jacksonville is someone who is looking at, at pollution and its effects. He, um, he studied uh, pollution effects from uh, oil rig disasters in the Gulf and and has done some work up in the St. John's River area. And uh, we talked just two weeks ago about trying to expand some of those studies and coming down here to the Indian River Lagoon area. Uh, pollution is a tough term to quantify because there's so many different things that can function as, as pollution. Sediment is a pollution in some sense of the word, especially if you're somebody that studies plankton and, and marine sea grasses and whatnot. Uh, and when we think of pollution, we think of chemical problems and things like that. So I think we need to broaden our scope a little bit. Right. Well, that'd be wonderful if they are able to extend the study. Um, and one question we have um, here is, would pelagic species be able to be tracked to find a gen general mating area? I answer that question is unequivocally yes. And some of the most recent work that's been done uh, has actually been done by Dr. Toby Daly Engel, who's up here at FIT. She's been working with tiger sharks. And they're not considered quite as pelagic as a mako or a great white or something like that. Um, but she's been able to do some exciting work and ultrasounds on live animals, the free swimming animals, unlike what we were able to do. Um, a lot of her work was featured on uh, some recent Discovery Channel shows. Uh, the work of O-Search is work that you all might want to follow, anyone might want to follow. Uh, they've been studying great whites and have been tagging great whites. Right now they're working off the coast of Massachusetts. They have a website, osearch.com probably, and they name each one of their sharks. You can actually call up an individual shark. Let's, let's say um, uh, Catherine. I picked Catherine because Catherine was actually tagged by a former student of mine. These have satellite transmitters on them. And when the shark comes to the surface, and that's, a, that's an important caveat, when they come to the surface, the satellite transmitters will burst transmit their location. And so you can track this shark. And for this reason, finally, after many years of O-Search's work, um, they're actually able to pinpoint areas where they find females during certain times of the year, and they're now finding young in that area. Now you can, you can draw some conclusions here, but at least it helps you focus on that area a little bit so that we can determine whether or not we actually have a nursery ground for more pelagic species. Now, Makos are similarly being studied. This is out of the Guy Harvey Research Institute at Nova University um, uh, that's being done. Uh, we have the, the tigers, we have great whites, and we have some other species. So the advent of new technologies have given us some insight into this. Dr. Chris Lowe at Cal State University, Long Beach, is doing the same thing with white sharks out on the Pacific coast. And they have gotten even closer to finding nursery grounds. So yeah, there's some exciting stuff going on. Awesome. Um, what is the best way for a recent grad to get involved in shark-based research? Oh boy, that's a really tough question. Uh, there are a lot of ways to, to get involved. I think I might know where that question came from <laughs> in our local audience. Um, going online and looking at research programs that study sharks, seeing what investigators are working with sharks, studying what they do, reading their papers, and then later contacting them, showing that you have an interest in their work, you have some knowledge of what they've been doing, and then most importantly, telling them where projects that you might propose would fit in with their research. That's the way to do it. As a professor, I would get 
I would get letters every single week that from students who wanted to work with me on, on nurse sharks. What the letters would typically say is, Dr. Carey, I'm really excited about working with sharks. I'd like to work with you. <laughs> Yeah, that, that tells me nothing. Then the kid who wrote me a letter and then came and visited said, this nurse shark reproduction is really exciting. And what you've shown is that there are many males that seem to mate with a female. What do you know about genetic diversity in these animals? What do you know about multiple paternity? Well, yeah, he, got, he worked with me. <laughs> and he's now um, a chief scientist at the New England Aquarium where he's doing some of the most outstanding stunning state-of-the-art work that I've seen. That's what gets you in the door. Knowing what somebody's doing and finding a fit for yourself in their work. Yeah, that is excellent advice. Yeah, that's great yeah. advice. Okay. All, right. All right, so uh, Lisa's gonna, I'm tagging her in. <laughs> like I can, I can read um, difficult handwriting entirely. Are there any shark species, not rays, that occur throughout the year and uh, beyond the influence of tides in the Indian River Lagoon? Mostly rays. Um, southern stingrays, uh, a couple others. I understand the clear nose skate, but I've not studied the skates well enough to know. Uh, black nose, we think, are pretty common. That's one of the reasons why uh, they've been tagged with uh, telemetry. We've been chasing down some black nose telemetry tags in the lagoon. Uh, and again, it's a study that you can try to maintain. One of the things that uh, has been known for quite some time is that when the water temperature drops, the sharks stop feeding. Um, some of the earlier work suggested that when water temperature dropped below about 68 degrees, uh, sharks would stop feeding. Well, for nurse sharks down in the Keys, when this happens, I can't find them. They're normally in shallow water. Shallow water in the Keys has gotten between 60 and 65 degrees on some of our colder, that's in the Keys now and some of our colder winter uh, uh, cold fronts that have come through, they go offshore. They go offshore to deeper water where the water temperature is more constant and is less subject to change. It'll drop slowly, but it won't drop down to 60, 62, 65 degrees. I imagine the same thing is, is true up here. So there are certain times of the year where you're gonna be more successful than others. Ooh, all right, so we have two questions that uh, relate to each other. Uh, the first one is, when the female is ready to mate, is she in heat? Uh, has blood been taken and hormone levels um, used for when reproductive time uh, for the female? That's a really good question. There's somebody with a physiology background here, I sense. Um, <laughs> reproductive readiness. Um, somehow is signaled to males. We don't know what it is. Heat would not really be a correct term since we tend to associate that with estrous cycles, not, not the case here. But there is no doubt there's a chemical signal, absolutely no doubt. We have seen males from a distance of 100 to 150 yards. A female might be on the beach with her nose on the beach. This is very common. A male might be 100 to 150 yards away. We have seen them swimming by and all of a sudden turn directly toward the female and come in at warp speed, pushing a wake in front of them. Uh, now, they're, they're not, they can't see the animals. So this is three, four, five feet of water, so they're not going to see from a distance of 100 yards away. I doubt seriously that they're sensing heartbeat or anything like that, not, or, or gill beats, respirations. It, it's got to be pheromonal, and it's got to be incredibly powerful. Now, I have tried for years to convince a student to swim behind a female nurse shark who's swimming, holding a little canister to collect any effluent that might be coming out. And to assay that, um, one of the best biochemists I knew, unfortunately passed away, he was interested in doing this. He wasn't interested in swimming behind the shark, but he was interested in having the work done. The hormonal work, I mentioned Dr. Jim Gelschleider of the University of North Florida. Um, Jim now has the capabilities to do analysis of the reproductive steroids that are involved, estradiol and a, a number of the other compounds that are known to be uh, it to influence reproduction in these animals hormonally. And uh, this is something that Jim wants to study. We had a long-term project with SeaWorld where we took blood samples uh, to assay for the hormones, and we sent them to an investigator out in Oregon who was the only person at the time that could do this work. She did all the analysis of elephant, 
um, effluents for Bush Gardens and SeaWorld. And, and so she had maybe 30 of our samples. Regrettably, she passed away and it wasn't discovered for some time and the freezer where she kept all of her samples um, failed and all the samples were destroyed. Now, um, this was done by an elaborate process called radioimmunoassay, which is a very involved, intricate process. Nowadays, um, our vet colleague at SeaWorld, I can take a sample, I can take a blood sample to her and she'll put it in her machine, um, pour herself a cup of coffee, come back and there's the analysis with all the reproductively active steroids. So the technology is wonderful. We're trying to do some of that work with her doing male reproductive steroids here off IRL, um, to offshore with our big male nurse sharks when they're reproductively active. I have no data on that. I, I, something I've wanted for a long time, but haven't been able to get. Awesome. All right, we have two more questions. I know we are a smidge over on time. Um, for those of you that are online, if you need to head out, that's totally fine. Uh, for those of you that are in person, if you need a bathroom break, um, but if you have a couple, of, if you're willing to answer two more questions, that'd be fun. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much. All right, so kind of go, taking to, to that next step, um, when birthing, the blood that comes uh, from the birth, is that attracting other sharks since they have a strong sense of smell? Um, Do they well, come to eat the babies? Uh, there's probably, I say this without ever having witnessed a nurse shark birth, um, there's probably no blood attached. What happens is the egg hatches. If you'll pardon me on the, those of you who are watching, I want to get uh, a piece and a part here. There is a hatching of the females, uh, of the young inside the females. These are nurse shark egg cases, a show and tell here, okay? They're, they're pretty large. And what we think happens is that these eggs hatch internally. The egg cases are expelled somehow. And then two to three weeks later, the young are born. Now the young, as you saw in one picture, a yolk sac attached to a, a developing embryo. Well, by the time they're ready for birth, the yolk sac has been completely absorbed. And the animal that you saw being held in, in Jill's hand, that's a neonate. There's still an umbilical scar, a yolk sac scar on this animal. Um, those of you at home probably can't see this, um, but there's actually a, a yolk sac scar. So when the animal is born, it comes out of the female and there's probably absolutely no blood blood associated with it. Now, are there intrauterine fluids that may come out? That's a possibility. And could they be attractant? Um, they could be. Um, we're, we're learning a little bit about this just in the last couple of days. There is a teeny tiny aquarium up in St. Augustine called, ironically, the St. Augustine Aquarium who have a captive female nurse shark and two captive males. And she's been expelling things for about two weeks now. We stopped there a couple of weeks ago and looked at her and photographed her and took pin clips of the males and the females. And she's been sending pictures. I've got some tissue samples. We don't know what it is, but it looks like it might be sloughed, sloughed off uterine material. And if any of that comes out with the birth of these um, pups, it's possible that that could be an attractant. Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't know. Come study with me. Your mm -hmm. guess would be as good as mine. All right. So this is our last question. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jeff Carrier. Um, what is the best thing that individuals like us watching can do to protect sharks? Well, fish for them. Or if you do, turn them loose. Um, I think that that this is an important question, but I think based on what I've seen and what we all know to be happening, I think protecting habitat is probably critical, not only for protecting um, sharks, but for protecting any commercially valuable species, whether it's fish, invertebrate. Um, we've seen the insults that have occurred to the Indian River Lagoon. We've seen the effect that 
that uh, loss of habitats has had. Oh, nobody's explained to me why we're losing so many manatees in the IRL. I mean, what is 30 something that have been found dead up in this area? Uh, over 700 have been lost this year. And then the, the, this whole problem with the West Coast and what's causing the red tides in the West Coast. I mean, Evans, as long as they've been around, you think we know more about their particular cause. And we know their effect. Um, I, I think environmental destruction may be the epitaph for marine species. If we don't do something about it, all of us, then uh, I, I think it's not only sharks at risk, it's anything that lives in the marine environment. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank we you. Appreciate the extra pleasure. questions you took. Thank you so much for our participants. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any additional questions for those of you who are here. Yes. Yes, ma'am.